Hi, I want to welcome you to Answers for Today. Uh, Chris is with me down in Texas. I'm here in Southern California. We're looking forward to a wonderful program here. As last week we started the, there in the last book that Paul wrote, uh, Second Timothy. We encourage you to get your Bibles and follow along. And we would really encourage you today as we're in chapter one of Second Timothy. And we're just going to work through the passages. There's so many much to talk about and look at. We thought we'd get, I thought, well, maybe we'll get through chapter two. Well, we got first three verses. So <laughs> Chris, welcome to the program. <laughs> Good to be with you, Terry. Oh, you know, when you, th- I, I often think of Paul, you know, they're in the last stages of his life. It, as we mentioned last week, uh, you know, some say it was just a couple weeks after this ladder, letter. Some say it was a couple months that he lost his life there on the APN way as Nero had him executed. He was beheaded out there, the best we, historians could tell us. But, and, and so, what we're reading is a, a letter of love and we should look at it as through the eyes of, of Timothy as he's receiving it and all for our, our own lives the words of encouragement especially in programs down the road because he really emphasized the days that we're living in right now and so we'll, Chris and I'll be talking about that in future programs but we're in verse number four if you could turn with me to verse number four now, I'm going to read it and and then have uh, Chris certainly comment on it where he opens up he says I greatly desire to see you because I remember your tears and of course uh, the best we could tell that we believe that you know some believe that Paul was arrested there at Ephesus uh, 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 and sent back to Rome and so he, he must have been a very emotional very uh uh, sad event that happened where Timothy was left behind uh, Chris and you know he knew that he was there uh, uh, there in Ephesus and yet he's now taken on the responsibility of running everything without Paul there and there was many many false teachers that of course that were creeping into the, the city already and so uh, young Timothy had his hands full to say the least. Right. Man, deeply troubling for a variety of reasons. You know, what what am I going to do without Paul? You know, what am I going to do without him being here present? And that real, real concern for the future of things, but also somebody who is, has become like a father to you, uh, knowing that he's been imprisoned and it doesn't look promising of what's happened. So Paul seems to have some kind of an awareness of, of the distress in Timothy, realizing that he may be without Paul. Hmm. Yeah, and as he goes on, he talked about how that you're that I might be filled with joy, and like he was talking about his this bond that the two of them had met, and knowing that Timothy was going to continue on with the faithfulness of the proclaim of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Paul at this time, of course, realized that he's not getting out of jail. This the death sentence has been setting on him. Uh, upon him but he had this great sense of joy knowing that that the work was going to continue and uh, this young man Timothy was going to be the man that was going to lead the charge and I think it's as he says in verse 5 I called in remembrance your unfringed faith uh, or pure faith that he's talking about uh, concerted Timothy uh, Chris yeah uh, this is this is somebody who is like Paul Paul sees him as a as a, a copy of the man that Paul is and I got to say, it's just, you know, I, I want to be able to, to thank God and be grateful to him because for me personally, I had a, my own version of Paul in this life and his name was Jack Stevens. So he was my senior pastor, uh, the man that I served under for 25 years roughly, and uh, a man who I just have the utmost respect for what he did. And I'm, I'm so thankful that, that God had him in my life because of what I learned from him. So I get this relationship part of it. And I, you know, obviously in, in the later years before he went home to be with the Lord, I had been with him for a long time and I was no longer this young guy. He, Jack passed in my 40s. I was in my 40s by the time he went to be with the Lord. But I certainly understand this idea of having somebody, if you're in the Timothy position, to look up and say, there's the man that God has used and he's shown me so much through this man. And then I can also see it from from the 
perspective of Paul too, of saying there's these people that you've poured your life into and now it's them and you're concerned for their well-being, but you say you've learned, you know these things. So depend on what you have learned and what God has shown you. You know, Chris, I, I'm glad you mentioned that as learning from others and godly men. And you had your pastor. I had my pastor. My pastor was Pastor Chuck Smith for 42 years. I uh, had the joy of being around him. And in the last few years, I was with Chuck every day, every day of his life. I was able to, over his home. I had that special relationship with Chris. I don't know why me. Why did I get this opportunity? But I did. And, and to see to see his walk away from the pulpit it, it inspired me so much that it, as he was going through not only struggles physically but struggles with the uh, this massive movement that we know as Calvary Chapel and see how he trusted in God I mean his faith is is something I think that that Timothy was watching Paul and like you were saying, you were watching Pastor Jack over at Cyprus, and I was watching Pastor Chuck over at uh, Costa Mesa, where Paul later on, when he says, be thou an example to the believers and how important it is in our life become, be, can affect other people's life as they not only listen to us from the pulpit, but they watch our character and the way we conduct ourselves and the things we do uh, that's so important. Right. I, I can say, you know, if, if Timothy and Paul were anything like my experience with Jack, uh, Jack was by no means perfect. And there were some times he did things and I thought, I'll remember this because if it's ever the same way, I probably won't do it the same way. I'm sure that <laughs> Timothy, by his his uh, observation of Paul, especially in Paul's earlier years, there were times that he can seem to be just so driven to do something that he might have ran through stop signs, you know. And uh, yeah. I'm sure that Timothy probably took mental note of those things because, you know, Paul, uh, Paul, I don't think was in by any stretch a wallflower. I think he was a pretty forceful man and, and uh, very much knew what God had called him to do. And he was driven by that. And, mm. uh, you know, of course, that'd be a great thing to learn of a man who is driven to serve God and nothing gets in his way. That's wonderful. And yes. know, sometimes zeal can, though, uh, sometimes make you just, like I say, run stop signs. <laughs> and, uh, we know that that happened I think with he, Paul. I think he ran a few stop <laughs> signs. <laughs> yes, he did. I'm sure he I, 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 I don't want to say how many stop signs my pastor did, but he was... His willingness to ri take risk, his willing, uh, godly ones. I'm not talking about bonehead things, you know, but uh, when it comes to the things of faith and step out and try things, one of the words that he used to say to me, Terry, let's go for it. And I go, okay, I mean, like not knowing what we're, what's the outcome going to be without calculating, without analyzing things. He would get a prompting of the Spirit and say, let's just go for it. Let's see what God will do. And that's a, such a tremendous thing. I'm sure Timothy saw it in Paul's life at times. Uh, was like, whoa, what are you talking about? We're going to go to this city. We just got beat up in the last one. Where are we going to go now? You know, <laughs> What a great thing. And, but how important it is for us to pass it on, our, our heritage. As he mentions his mother and his grandmother there and all that, that we as believers, you know, not only as pastors, you and I, but as fathers and as brothers and sisters of the Lord, we need to pass on the, the really the treasures that God gives us to other people. Because your life is an influence on the others and it never was intended for us to bottle up his, you know, the things we learn from the Lord, but to, to share in kindness and love and encouragement and exhortations and use those things to build up the body of Christ, Chris. How important it is for us, isn't it? Massively important because, I mean, we should really recognize this, that no matter what we do, um, people are watching us. No, you can say, yeah, but I'm not a pastor. I'm not a this. I'm not a that. It doesn't mean that people don't watch you because they know your testimony. And so, you know, if it's people that are outside of the church, we want to make sure that what we represent is, a, is an accurate uh, portrayal of what it is to be a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're yes. in a place where God uses you in ministry, then you want to say, I want to make sure that what I say is completely in keeping with what is in the scripture. And I don't want to give people my opinion 
I want to stay with what the scripture has to teach because God's the one with the authority and he's the one who has spoken. I don't need to put words in his mouth. I need him to put his in mine. Yes, yes, good. Well, as you go on in verse number six, what we see, what Paul says, he says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God that is in thee by the putting uh, uh, on of my hands. And so he's getting, he's obviously when he says uh, they put these things in remembrance, Paul was concerned that maybe through all the emotions and everything out that he was going through as Timothy's now uh, step it up to the plate per se and take it on a lot more responsibility that some of the the giftings that he had received had become either do dormant in his life or he's ceased from exercising the gifts by which uh, God has enabled Timothy in the ministry it's so important in fact what uh, you know, you could go back to Acts and you could see and read about how the ministry there in Lystra, where Timothy is a young man, where he joined up with Paul and how he, Paul laid hands upon him. And he speaks about these gifts of the Holy Spirit that, that he received. It's important, this lesson that he's given to us, Chris, uh, that we don't ne neglect the gifts of God that God has given us, isn't it? Absolutely true. And I, it, you, we may know exactly what Paul was referring to here. If we look in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, in verse 12, we get this where he says to, to Timothy, it's a much less personal note versus uh, 2 Timothy, but still you can tell that there's a real fellowship between them. He says, let no one despise your youth, but rather be an example to the believers in word, in your conduct, in your love, in your spirit, in faith and in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. Pay attention to the things of importance. And then look at verse 14. Don't neglect the gift that is in you, which was yes. given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. So it's that reminder that, Timothy, don't forget where you've come from. If you want to go back to your childhood and Lois and Eunice, those people who taught you the scriptures that lead you to salvation, as we'll read about in chapter 3 of this Second Timothy, or if it's the elders who have laid hands on you, or if it's the things that I've instructed you, don't forget any of those things because God's the one who has gifted you for this time. And don't forget those things. Don't neglect them. And don't. That's, that's a good way of saying don't lean on your own self. Lean on what God has made you into and don't forget those things. Yeah. So the encouragement to all of us is to stir up the gift that is in you. Don't allow it to kind of level out. You might say, I don't know what my gift is, what God has given me. Well, ask him. Ask him to fill you. Ask him to that you might receive whatever gifts that he wants to impart onto you. Uh, you might want to uh, take a look uh, either to our website or to Chris's website and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12's teaching and, and the various uh, teaching that we have on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you'll see that God wants to give you gifts for the equipping of your life so your life could be impacting in the world that we live in. And, and so he says, that, and he says, how do you receive the gifts of God? That's how, one of the questions. Do you earn it? Do you work your way? Do you, what do you do? I always tell people, Chris, that you receive it the same way you receive the Lord. It's by faith, isn't it? Definitely by faith and then to be available to what he wants to do. Because I believe the gifts are situational. And that is, mm. if God has you in a particular place and he needs you to, to operate in a particular gift, he can use you if you're available to him and willing to do what he asks you to do. So we can yeah. see where the gifts are enumerated. Some of them are very, very out front and they're very obvious and you see them and everybody knows them. There are other ones that are done behind the scenes that very few people ever see, but a church can't function without them. So, you know... Well, the they, we think the gift of governments, the gift of hospitality, the gift of faith uh, that he speaks about. Uh, you go right down the list there in Romans also it speaks. In, and but the, the thing is that he was telling, uh, uh, Paul, uh, Paul was telling Timothy, don't let it flatline in your life. You know, stir, allow it to be bubbly. Allow God to, to work in your life and through your life. And if that's you where you just feel kind of blah, 
go back to the fountain, the fountain of living water and seek the Lord. And you, you don't need to go to some big Holy Ghost meeting or anything like that. You could do it right now by faith and say, Lord, I'm feeling empty. I don't feel the spirit moving in me. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, as you talk to him, then just wait upon him. Open your heart and he'll do that marvelous work of, that he wants to do in every believer. Because he tells us, he tells us that he has, God has not given you the spirit of fear. Chris, that's an old tool of Satan, isn't it? Why don't you talk to the body of Christ right now about that? Verse? Sure, because fear can, can enter in through any number of things. It can be just by somebody saying something about you or even your own personal failure that maybe you only are the ones who know about it. And um, you're just thinking, oh, how can God use me? And is he angry with me? And, you know, we can start asking all of these kinds of questions that just come, you know, fear is there. It can actually even be the situation like, you know, Timothy might be looking at this. Paul's going to be gone. Ephesus is no cakewalk. This is a difficult place. And yet I'm the person that they see as being in charge here. That can be a fearful thing. We start to look at our own abilities and say, how can I do this? I think that's a great question for anybody to be able to ask, to say, how am I going to be able to do this? I want to be able to say and be honest with them, you can't do it. So get over yourself. Now, let God do something <laughs> through you because it's not about you. It's about him using a vessel that makes themselves available to him. He supplies the, the information. I think it's so important that we, as we look and understand in the application of this, and if you find your life kind of wrapped with fear right now, then realize what he, what Paul just says, God is not the author of that fear. You know, rather he tells us, but what God is the author is of power, love, and a sound mind. And so if you're lacking those things, then you need to go to God. You need to bring it to him, and he wants to give you power within your life and obviously the power i believe is the power of the holy spirit but the dunamis that he's talking about in, in the flow here and and when you say what is the holy spirit the holy spirit's part of the triunity and the holy spirit is god first john tells us that god is love notice the second thing he says he gives us not only a, a, the holy spirit but he gives us the love the insurance that god is for us and then and then he clears your mind up well, i'm so thankful for that third part the soundness of mind chris talk to us a little bit about this these are not going to be able to go on um, unless there is a lack of fear because fear will override those other things Fear is what keeps you from being able to walk in the power in the dynamic life that God has given to you to do. So if God says, I got a bunch of things I'd love to do through you. Yeah, but I'm so filled with fear. OK, you're never going to understand that power. And it's going to get in the way of your loving the Lord and loving others because you're so focused on you and your fear. And let's face it, the the ultimate total opposite of fearfulness is having a, a mind that is disciplined mm -hmm. and that is that that is you know sound so a sound mind would say oh i can think of a whole lot of stuff to be afraid of but god hasn't called me to be afraid of that stuff it, he's called me to say i'm going to stay focused on him the one who supplies me with power and the one who loves me that i can love others and that's a disciplined mind that keeps you from fear you know, and that's why we as pastors, you, a lot of times you hear this, but I think it's so important because we take it from not only this uh, lesson of Paul, but the words of Jesus, where it says man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God, that we you daily, uh, uh, you know, feed feast upon the word of God, because that gives you that clarity of mind and gives you really a leading of, of your life that you're being led of God and there's nothing more richer than having that knowledge that God is for you and you're hearing the voice of God as he speaks to you through the scriptures. Chris, I know in your life and your teaching that you see, maybe you could share with the people really the importance of just reading your Bible verse by verse. I know that's how you teach and how I also teach, but why is it so important for us to, as an individual, the, as you journey through the Bible, that you just read through the Bible? Because it's the best way to know how God deals with things in all manner of situations and even in different covenants. 
um, you know, I was just uh, just yesterday um, putting up the study that I did and we're going through Second Samuel. Uh, chapter six and chapter seven are really amazing when you put them together. The 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 uh, Ark of the Covenant had been in in a place where it shouldn't have been for years, and David wants to bring it back into the into Jerusalem where he is now headquartered, and they try to put it on a cart, and they never should have put it on a cart. God said, "I want this carried. It is not to be done any other way, and it must be the priests who do it." And so as it's on its way back to Jerusalem, a man, because he's afraid that it might fall off the cart, touches it and he dies. David is angry about that. And God could have said, hey, that man shouldn't have died, but it's not on me. It's on you. You were transporting it in a way I said never to do it. That's important for us. We need to know when God says to do something a particular way, don't take it upon yourself. And so it starts off, chapter 6, it's heartbreaking what happens. And yet as the chapter ends, the ark makes it in the way that it was supposed to, and there's joy. By chapter 7, he just goes, I have this wonderful place to live, and God has nothing. And God says, I don't need anything. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to make something for you. I'm going to make a house for you. You already have a palace, but I'm going to make a legacy out of you. And from you, one will come from your life from your family that will sit upon my throne forever, a promise of Jesus Christ. And so if we're just hopping around from one chapter to another or one verse to another, and we're not studying through the scripture, we lose so much of what God wants to communicate. A great rule of thumb, Terry, I know you'll agree with this. If God took the time to write it, it is wise of us to take the time to read. Uh, I like that. <laughs> you know, I, I echo the same thing with Chris was saying, and I would really encourage you to find a, a church that that will take you line by line, verse by verse through the Bible. Um, I know the popular thing that seems to be nowadays, Chris, is hop, skip, skip it around on various uh, uh, topics. Uh, you know, what the Bible, Paul talks about it. It's really does, uh, or I forget where exactly where it's at. Maybe you'll remember where they go after itchy, itching ears, basically. Try, try to just kind of scratch your ear like, oh, that's interesting. And they can draw amazing uh, large crowds with these things. But really what lasts is the Word of God and the power to, of the Word of God. And we're looking for the soundness of mind. That's what Paul here is writing here. He says, God wants you to have a sound mind. And that's where it comes through is through the Word of God. I, I, you know, I believe how important it is for us to, to set up some time for each and every day that we read God's Word, that we meditate on God's Word, and we allow the Holy Spirit to do a work within our hearts day by day by day. I tell you, you can't go wrong there, Chris. I agree. And what you quote is that itching ears is found in chapter four of the book that we're in right here. The time's going to come. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. The time's going to come when they're going to heap to themselves teachers because their ears are itching and they're looking for someone to scratch them. You and I were talking yes. before the program about this, that now church has come uh, to a point where it's really flashy. And so what can the pastor do to draw attention to himself that makes the, makes people, it draws them in? I get uh, mm -hmm. the picture if Paul was to come here in our lives right now, he would do as much as he could not to make himself the issue, but rather pointing to the scriptures that has the power to transform a life. So the more mm -hmm. strutting and huffing and puffing a man does behind the pulpit, the more attention he draws to himself and the less attention is drawn to the scripture. So mm -hmm. you and I come from a tradition that we don't want to make ourselves the op, you know, we don't, we don't want to be the optics of it. We don't want to be the center of attention. What we want is, if anything, and I know we've talked about this, you and I before, I hope that every single time that I sit down to teach a Bible study, there will be things that God can use of what I say that a person may remember a year from now, can't remember where they heard it, but they heard it somewhere. <laughs> I love that. You, yes. Yeah. This is what we yeah. desire, man. If I don't care if they don't remember who it was that said no. it, so long as they no. remember it and it was accurate. You know, I, I, I was watching or listening. Some people were... You know, I've been a part of Calvary Chapel my whole entire life. Uh, I don't want to tell you how old I am, but, you know, I'm getting that, getting up there. And, you know, my pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, God used tremendously. And he had such a, a great way to simply teach the Bible simply. 
And on Sunday nights, if you don't have services, uh, we have it on his channel now where you could sit and watch Pastor Chuck go verse by verse uh, through the entire Bible. And what an example that is for us. And I know that there's some Calvary chapels and churches have gone away from that. You know, I, I pray that you would consider, reconsider, examine what, how you're teaching the Bible, that you given people the word of God so they could experience what hear what Paul is telling Timothy that they could have that soundness of mind it's the word of God the power of God's word that people come uh, to hear I remember as a young pastor my wife came to me and she I go I, we we're driving home after service Chris and I go well, what'd you think? How'd you, how was it? She goes, well, you know how your wife, when they say, well, you would go, uh-oh, what did, how did I goof up? And she says, can I just say something to you? I go, I, I found myself getting all defensive, Chris. And, and, and they go, they didn't come to hear your stories. They came to hear the Bible. And I go, oh, my goodness gracious, she's right. And help us. And continue to pray for Chris and I that we would represent God well and teach the Bible verse by verse. Pray for your pastors to, and, and across the country that we would represent the Lord. And so until next time, may God richly bless you. We love you and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye now. information about this broadcast or if you have questions feel free to contact us either by mail at agape chapel oc p.o box 4023 huntington beach california 92647 or you can email us at aft at agape chapel oc dot org you can also visit our website at agape chapel oc dot com we here at Answers for Today would like to thank you for watching and to remind you to look up for your redemption draws near. Till next time.